Hello and welcome to the podcast from the Confines Institute for Sports Medicine and Human Performance at Texas A&M University. I'm your host, Tim Lightfoot, and I'm so glad you've taken the time to join us uh, as we interview another interesting person in the world of human performance and sports medicine. And actually, we're, inter we're interviewing an interesting person about another interesting person, which is a little bit unique for us. Uh, but before we get started, we are hopeful that all of you have stayed healthy and well, certainly when we started doing podcasts during COVID back in March, we didn't expect, I think many of us didn't expect to be doing this as long as we have, but we have. I would remind you that we have resources on our website at HuffineInstitute.org. Um, and here is a link right here to the latest guidelines from the American College of Sports Medicine and the World Health Organization about exercising during the time of COVID. We would continue to encourage you to exercise. As a matter of fact, you'll find at the ACSM website that there's a lot of resources right there, especially for not only just your, your exercise, but also for returning to sports, the financial considerations, other ways that your small business, if you're in the exercise world, can look to get some relief uh, during this pandemic time. So use that link uh, because it is uh, got a great, a lot of great resources uh, there for you. As I said, today is going to be a little bit different than our normal podcast. Normally, we interview interesting people to talk about their topics of interest, maybe their research they're doing, an event they're working on. But today, we're certainly talking to an interesting person. Um, we have actually interviewed our guest today uh, a couple of times already. But there's been an interesting article that's come to our attention that we wanted to share, that we've shared widely amongst ourselves and our lab staffs, and we wanted to share this on the podcast today. But first, let me take a minute to introduce our, our, our guest today, uh, chat a little bit, give you a little bit of idea about why we have him back on the podcast talking about this, and then we can just jump off into our topic. So I'm really pleased to welcome back to the podcast one of our one of my longtime friends, and uh, one of our friends of the Health Science Institute, Dr. David Bassett from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Welcome back to the podcast, David. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this, I think this is the first video podcast we've done with you, so this is a new experience for, for all of us. Uh, I'm gonna tell the audience a little bit about you, about you before we get started on this. Uh, Dr. Bassett is a professor and the department head of the Department of Kinesiology, Recreation and Sports Studies at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, he has his PhD uh, from the University of Wisconsin in, in Madison. He has his master's degree from Ball State. Um, his primary research is the measurement of physical activity and energy expenditure in humans using objective methods. Uh, if any of you were in a pedometer or a Fitbit or any kind of activity measurement, uh, it is a good bet that Dr. Bassett's extensive work has been used somewhere uh, in those devices uh, as they calculate how much, how far you walk or how much energy you, you use. Uh, uh, his work has been foundational in all that over the last 25 years as those devices have really exploded in popularity. Uh, Dr. Bassett has, has won many awards. He was given the Montoy Research Award at the uh, Southeast American College of Sports Medicine Regional Chapter. In uh, 2018, he was given the Citation Award by the National American College of Sports Medicine Organization, which is their second highest award for exercise physiology in the United States, actually for internationally, not just the United States. And also in 2018, he was one of our Hilliard discussion speakers here at the Huffines Institute, and you can find his talk on our website as well. Uh, so again, we've known Dave for a long time, and uh, one of his, I won't say hobbies, because he has actually published in this area quite a bit, has been a historical perspective on the accomplishments of a scientist that many of us in exercise physiologists know, physiology know, uh, a fellow by the name of Dr. A.V. A. Hill. And a paper came, uh, was published uh, about a couple years ago in a journal called The Advances in Physiological Education that talked about A.V. Hill and not just about his science, which we are gonna talk about today because if you haven't heard of A.V. Hill, we want you to understand how important he was to exercise physiology. But it showed a side of A.V. Hill that a lot of people didn't know about. Um, and as Dr. Bass and I were talking earlier, what's amazing is you expect great scientists to do great things in science, but when they do great things outside of science, it really makes you step back and think, wow, what can we be doing right now to help the world become a better place just instead of our science? So with all of that as a background, again, welcome to the podcast, Dave. I, let's just start off. Tell us a little bit about 
who A.V. Hill was as a scientist and some of his accomplishments. Yeah, well, uh, it's interesting to note that the initials A.V. stand for Archibald Vivian Hill. Uh, he was from Great Britain, uh, lived in the 1900s, um, and he did some really groundbreaking work. Uh, he's been called the giant in exercise physiology, so he's really one of the founding you know, fathers of our field um, uh, and, and has done some really incredible work. It was interesting, I came across a blog the other day that said, A.V. Hill was a great scientist and he had some really hot muscles, <laughs> which I thought was a wonderful title because he is in fact recognized for his work on heat production in skeletal muscle. It's, it, it, and, and you're right, so much of what we learn and what we teach our students had some kind of start with A.V. Hill um, and some of his comp accomplishments. Tell, and, and he worked, he did a lot of this work back in the 1920s and 1930s without a lot of modern equipment we have. And I've always been amazed at how much he got right from the little bit of data that he had. And so tell us a little bit about some of those experiments and some of the things he got right and what some of the awards that he won. Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of it too was that he was an athlete himself. And mm -hmm. so he had some pretty keen insights into how the human body uh, adjusted to exercise acutely and then some of the training adaptations that go on over many, many years. So um, one of his claims to fame was the ability to measure uh, heat production in muscle and he built his own thermocouples. Uh, you know, he got to where he could measure temperature of muscle way down below one ten thousandth of a degree Celsius. So he was a real expert in this area of building thermocouples. Um, and that was actually what helped him to, to get the Nobel Prize. Um, in, in 1923, Actually, actually, a year delayed, he and Otto Meyerhoff were given the Nobel Prize, the 1922 Nobel Prize for physiology or medicine, basically for the discovery of anaerobic metabolism. Mm. And what allowed Hill to contribute to this field was that he looked at, um, you know, he sent a tetanizing current down to an isolated frog muscle, and he looked at the increase in the temperature of the muscle as the muscle contracted. And what he found was that the heat production was divided into four phases. There was the initial heat production when the muscle initially shortened, the maintenance heat when it maintained that t t tetanus, and then there was the relaxation heat and the recovery heat. And what was so interesting about this was he found that the heat that was produced during the actual muscle contraction was totally independent of oxygen. Didn't matter whether you had the muscle in oxygen or in a nitrogen environment, it was exactly the same. So he said, oh, it looks like this metabolic pathway that's producing energy for muscle contraction is independent of oxygen. And then when he looked at the recovery heat production, that was highly dependent on oxygen. When you put the muscle in nitrogen, it practically disappeared. So, I mean, this was a remarkable discovery because scientists had known about aerobic heat production since the 1700s, the days of Lavoisier and so forth. But they had no idea that there was another metabolic pathway did, that did not require oxygen. Now, the other part to this is, uh, you know, Otto Meyerhoff's, Otto Meyerhoff's contribution. He was a Jewish scientist, a biochemist from Germany, and he was also looking at isolated frog muscle. Uh, what he found was that when frog muscles contract, the levels of glycogen decrease and the levels of lactic acid increase. But then in the recovery phase, what happens? The lactic acid goes back down again and glycogen reappears. And part of that lactic acid is actually combusted in oxidation. So this was phenomenal groundbreaking work to identify a metabolic pathway in muscle that had never been known about before. And over the years, Meyerhoff continued to do more and more work on it along with Gustav Emden, another German uh, biochemist. 
and that pathway that they discovered became known as the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway, or what we now call anaerobic glycolysis. So pretty cool stuff. Yeah, and, and the context is, is that we, and we don't think about it, this was over a hundred years ago, without all the electronics, without the computers. So yeah. these things, these thermocouples that were built were just are primitive by our times now, but at that time, they were, it's amazing to me to think oh. back that the, they were doing this stuff a hundred years ago and they figured out stuff that now we would still have problems figuring out. Absolutely. Yeah, it was real state of the art stuff. And, and then I think another thing that brought Hill a lot of uh, fame was that he then took these discoveries in the isolated frog muscle and he applied them to the exercise in human. So this was real, you know, groundbreaking work in applied exercise physiology. And so for one of the studies that he did was an analysis of athletic records. So he was looking at people who were, you know, what are the top speeds of people running the 100 meter dash or the mile or the marathon? And he showed this power curve and he said, by gum, you know, there's more power produced in the 100 meter dash than there is in the mile or in the marathon. And he explained it all uh, by, by talking about the aerobic and anaerobic contributions to these various events. So it's really cool is I, I've seen pictures and I think we have a picture here that's gonna pop up on the screen about some of the things that he did with humans, things like putting gas bags on their back while they sprinted to collect their gas samples. Um, we have different ways of doing that nowadays where you don't have to run with these gas bags on. But he really took the approach of trying a whole lot of different things uh, to try to sort this out in humans, uh, as opposed to just using the animal models, like the frogs that you talked about a few minutes ago. That's right. And, and I mean, he was a master at measuring oxygen intake. And one of the things that he did was he, just like he did in the frog muscle, he studied the time course of the increase in oxygen intake. And then he studied the oxygen intake into the recovery phase. And what he found was that he made this critical distinction between the oxygen intake and the oxygen requirement. That is, as you run faster and faster and faster, the oxygen requirement goes up, 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 up. But eventually, you reach a point where your oxygen intake levels off. And he called that the maximum oxygen intake. And uh, so that was just a really critical discovery of the difference between oxygen intake and oxygen requirement. Um, he also, you know, really founded the whole concept of VO2 max. You know, what are, he talked about what are the limiting factors for VO2 max. He said, I think it's partly due to the heart, the pumping capacity of the heart, you know, cardiac output. I think it's partly due to the diffusion capacity in the lung for oxygen. Um, and I think it's partly the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So this is foreshadowing, you know, studies of blood doping done by Ekblom, where they showed that, hey, you put in more red cells, you get an increase in oxygen uptake. And um, then he even talked about diffu a diffusion limitation in the skeletal muscle. That is, you know, to go from the oxygen has to get from the hemoglobin, it has to go across the red cell membrane, across the sarcolemma, all the way down to the mitochondria. And uh, Mike Hogan has shown that there is in fact some evidence for diffusion limitation in muscle. And all of these limiting factors were foreshadowed by Hill. I mean, he wrote about them even though he didn't have the scientific instruments to measure them. In fact, one of the really interesting stories is, you know, we he concluded that even during maximal exercise, the lungs were not the limiting factor. And you go, well, how did he do that? He didn't have a pulse oximeter. What he did was he looked at the subject's lips and their fingernail beds, and he saw they were not cyanotic at the end of a VO2 max test. So he said, oh, the blood must be well oxygenated. I don't think the lungs are the limiting factor. So those are the really kind of keen insights he had into the exercise in human. Yeah, and, and that question about whether or not the lungs are limiting factors in humans and healthy humans, anyway, that, that question persisted until what, I think the 80s or something until it was with some of the modern technology. So again, there's an example of he got stuff right 60 years before um, there was a technology to prove it. Now, about 1933, though, there were some things happening in the world that made him uh, stop and decide to use his talents 
elsewhere for other things. I mean, he still did science. Uh, and that's really the focus of this paper that came out by Jack Raw. Uh, and by the way, we did ask Jack if he would come on the podcast, but he very politely declined and pointed us to our friend Dave Bassett here uh, as the, the expert on this. Uh, and so Dave, tell us a little bit about what happened in 1933 and kind of what happened here with A.V. Hill that uh, a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, so in about 1933 was when Adolf Hitler was coming to power in Germany. And so that was about the time that, um, you know, a lot of restrictions were being put on Jewish people living in Germany. And German, I mean, Jewish scientists were actually being terminated and dismissed from their posts. And um, in many cases, they chose to flee the country because they had uh, a feeling that something bad was going to happen. And so you had these hundreds and hundreds of Jewish scientists who were leaving Germany, not only in the field of biochemistry and muscle physiology, but in the arts and humanities and music, you know, they were trying to get out of Germany. And so A.V. Hill was one of the founding um, members of the All, uh, Academic Assistance Council. This was one of about three groups in Great Britain that was helping these um, Jewish academics uh, find posts and, and get relocated to other countries. So he played a really, really pivotal role and they helped many, many hundreds of scientists and other academics um, get, get out of Germany. Yeah, this is so incredible because um, there really has been no other time like this where you have a huge group of not only an, an ethnic group being run out of a country, but uh, oftentimes that ethnic group included many of the top rank scientists uh, you talked about Meyerhoff a few minutes ago as being sharing the Nobel Prize. He was one of those that lost his post, wasn't he? Yes, yes. Uh, and and actually, um, you know, A.V. Hill went to bat for his friend Otto Meyerhoff. Again, these were the two guys that were co-awarded the Nobel Prize in 1922. So A.V. Hill contacted the Rockefeller Foundation and said, can you guys, you know, provide some money so that we can get get him over to the United States. And they actually created a position for Meyerhoff at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a great photo of Meyerhoff surrounded by all of his lab personnel at the University of Pennsylvania. And he remained there uh, from the mid 1930s all the way up till his retirement in 1951. So, so that's the kind of impact that A.V. Hill's efforts had. And it wasn't just for people like Meyerhoff. It was uh, this organization that he co-founded and wound up uh, rising, uh, I believe, what position did he wind up holding with this organization? I'm not sure the exact position, but he was definitely in the leadership you know, role. Right. He was writing a lot of the letters, in fact, uh, that got these people placements in other countries. And there were literally, I, I believe, if I recall the numbers correctly, there were literally hundreds and hundreds of these scientists that he was successful, he and this organization were successful in finding positions for, not necessarily in Britain, but also, as you said, they spoke on their behalf in other countries as well. Yes. And, you know, as time went on and the Germans, uh, Germany wound up invading France, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Austria, you know, it wasn't just Germany, it was these other countries too, where the scientists had to flee from other countries. Um, one of the people who, who fled from Germany uh, was a young fellow by the name of Bernard Katz. Mm -hmm. And he had read an article that A.V. Hill wrote. He, he actually gave the Huxley Memorial Lecture, which was published in Nature. And Hill took that occasion to speak out against the German government and to say that you know, Jewish scientists were being dismissed from their post and 100,000 political prisoners were being held in concentration camps. And this guy, Jonas Stark, who was a, a German, he, write back, he wrote back right away and said, A.V. Hill is a liar. This is not true. None of this stuff is happening in Germany. And Hill would have nothing of it. He, they started this point-counterpoint rebuttal in the journal. And Hill was saying, no, I'm sorry, this is true you know, Jewish scientists are being dismissed from their posts, and uh, many, many people are being held in, in concentration camps. Uh, they are not 
they are not enemies of the state as the Germans were calling them, they are political prisoners. Um, so when, when Bernard Katz read this article, you know, he, he really wanted to go work with A.B. Hill. And I, I don't know if he wrote to him ahead of time, something I read suggests that he just kind of showed up on the doorstep of his laboratory. And, you know, Hill just put his arm around him and he said, sure, we'll take you in. And he, he created a position for him. He introduced him to all the folks in his lab. And as they were touring the lab, one of the interesting stories was they came upon this shrine, kind of like this um, shelf on a wall. And it was like a shrine to Adolf Hitler. And <laughs> Katz was kind of taken aback by that. But they explained to him, well, this is to thank Adolf for sending us all of these fine scientists from Germany. <laughs> and then they gave him an, a little air gun and they said, okay, now your task is to try to knock Hitler off of the shelf. <laughs> so they kind of made a game of it. And, and you know, I think, I think laughter was considered, you know, a necessary way to deal with the tragedies that were occurring. Um, but they, they did, they didn't just laugh, they tried to do something about it as well. Well, it, it, it I think it brings up a point. It's not that he worked work behind the scenes quietly to relocate these people. He was also very vocal about what he saw happening in Germany um, and what he saw happening in Britain because he got a lot of, they got a lot of pushback in Britain about relocating these scientists to Britain in particular. Oh yes, they're, they're because of, there wasn't a, exactly a flood, but there were lots and lots of Jewish people coming to Great Britain and uh, there was concern that they were taking jobs away from the Brits. So the anti-Semitic feelings in Great Britain did start to, to grow. And uh, initially only one in a hundred Brits favored putting Jewish and other German, Jewish refugees and other Germans into concentration camps in Great Britain. Only one in a hundred Brits were in favor of that. But, but then the tide shifted and, and it shifted almost entirely to the point where only one in a hundred people was not in favor of putting them in concentration camps. So you wound up with a situation where some of these unfortunate fellows, you know, they, they had to flee their home countries like Austria and Germany to get away from the Nazis and they came to England, but then they had to flee England to get away from being put in a concentration camp in England. So they were almost like double refugees. And that, that was really amazing. There were, there were about 70,000 people from uh, Germany who had to be evaluated and they were put into these three categories uh, based on their loyalty, uh, and the, the, to, to their mother, motherland, and then the, the, you know, assessed level of risk that they posed to Great Britain. So quite, quite a remarkable story, really. Well, and that's, that's the piece that a lot of people don't hear about, not only about A.V. Hill, and not only did he speak out, but he helped found this organization to relocate these scientists that were being run out of their home countries. Um, but also faced such a big black backlash at home and public sentiment turned became very anti-Semitic in Great Britain, uh, for example. And we don't hear that. We, we don't hear that that happened. Um, and so that was, that was one of those interesting pieces uh, of this whole episode. Now, A.B. Hill during World War II did not keep his lab open. He did other things for the government. Let me share with that with the audience a little bit. Yeah, so actually, he shut his lab down in, uh, well, I, I don't know if it was his lab, but he might have been a postdoc. But in World War I, he, he actually worked for the Army for about four years. And then again in World War II, from 1939 to 1945, he completely closed down his laboratory. And he said, you know, there's more important work to be done. And he went to work for the British government in a variety of capacities. One of the things he did was he started this registry of, um, of individuals who had different types of scientific skills that could be useful in the war effort. So then if they had to find somebody, for example, who knew about uh, radar or, or you know, some particular um, uh, skill like, like cryptography or something like that, they could, they could just 
quickly call up a list of people who were qualified to do that. So he, he ran this registry. Um, he also was a member of the Tizard Committee. And this is a committee that reported directly to Winston Churchill, but they were a bunch of physicists and mathematicians, and they actually conducted the first successful effort to detect uh, incoming aircraft using radar. And, and then uh, A.V. A. Hill served as a special air attache for the British government. He was sent over to the America to make friends with the Americans and to put in their minds that they should be sharing military secrets with the Brits. And this was a very successful effort. He came back and wrote two reports about it. And then the entire Tizard committee went over to America. They brought with them some examples of their radar technology. Uh, there was stuff on airplane engines, uh, all kinds of other military technology that the Americans and the Brits shared back and forth after uh, A.V. Hill's original pioneering effort to make friends with the Americans. So this was, this was like a really unique capacity that Hill had was his capacity for friendship. I mean, he could make friends with everybody. And he used this to such great... Um, you know, benefit of, to his country. He was just a super patriot. He was also, as you probably read, a, a member of the British Parliament for about four or five years. So he did all kinds of work there. He went to India, he established the All India Medical Council, which set up the first series of medical schools in India. Um, and he used his influence as a member of Parliament to lobby for, you know, let's try to get these, um, academicians out of the concentration camps in Great Britain and allow them to go to other countries. So he, he was a very, very influential person. Um, another thing Jack Rawl pointed out was that he was involved in a second society, the Society for the Protection of Science and Learning. And so this was another group other than the uh, Academic Assistance Council that was very, very involved in helping um, these, these uh, Germans who were located in, in concentration camps in Great Britain to get out of the concentration camps. It, it's, a, it's, it's amazing as we look back, um, again, great scientists we usually think of, of their, for their accomplishments. I mean, Nobel Prize winners have a certain cachet. We may not know exactly what they did, but we, whatever it is, is recognized as, as great at the time. Uh, but here is someone who said, you know what, there's more to do. And um, when things started to go south in Germany, he said, we're going to help these people. When it, went, when it happened in the rest of Europe, he helped his colleagues as well, even facing blowback at home and pushback uh, about what he was doing. He was very vocal about it. He continued on. He then helped the government um, in very successful war efforts. And so it really says something about, I think, for us, what we should be doing uh, as scientists. And one of the things I always push my students to do is let's think about the bigger picture. Uh, we can do our science all day long, but how is that helping people? Are there things that we can do to help? And I know that there have been so many people now in this day and time during the pandemic in particular, uh, but also during some of the appropriate conversations about race that have started to say, you know, what else can we do? other than it's great to be in the lab and investigate molecular pathways, at least that's for us, uh, but what else can we do? And, I, and I've been pleased to see that amongst some of our colleagues that have stepped up to do those things. Yeah, and you know, I agree. I was looking uh, on, on the internet last night and, and I was just interested in how many people died in World War II uh, because of World War II. It was like 65 million people. That number is just staggering, you know? So Hill was looking at the situation around him and saying, you know what, there's something bigger than just measuring heat production in muscle or measuring oxygen consumption of runners. And he was fortunate in being in a position where he, his salary and so forth, I guess, was secure and, and he could actually stop doing science and stop teaching and he could really devote himself wholeheartedly to the war effort, which he did for, for about five or six years. And I think it's uh, certainly to the great benefit of the uh, allied forces that he did that. Um, 
and certainly it was to the benefit of all the the hundreds and perhaps thousands of people that he helped. I think the Society for the um, Protection of Science and Learning, they had 2,000 people on their roster. So I believe that that was the number of people that they helped uh, to get relocated. And there is a great quote. Uh, it's actually on the first page of Jack Rawls' article, if, I, if you don't mind my reading it. But this is what Bernard Katz had to say about, you know, what was Amy Hill's real contribution to science? Was it, was it just about physiology or was it something greater than that? And he said, um, in fact, committed though Hill was throughout his life to work in the laboratory, it was his concern for others, the encouragement he gave to young colleagues, his upright defense, not only of the cause of science, but of scientific men who had been driven from their places of work and needed help. In short, it was his devotion to such wider issues outside the boundaries of his own research, through which he exerted his most important influence on other people's lives and on the course of events. That sums it up pretty, pretty well, I think. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I think that's a great place for us to start to wrap up the conversation because it does, it, it puts a good, uh, exclamation uh, point yeah. and that is we it's too easy for us to all to put our heads down and ignore what's going on but we need to have the courage to stand up and do the right thing and certainly ab hill did didn't he he did and and i gotta get in one more thing though <laughs> you know bernard katz he went on to win a nobel prize himself um along with julius axelrod and some other folks for the uh, transmission of action potentials from the nerve into the muscle. So all that stuff you read about with acetylcholine and the receptors and the motor end plate, that is the work of um, Bernard Katz, who was A.B. Hill's student for about five years. And was attracted to go to that lab because of what A.B. Hill was saying about what was going on in the world. Absolutely. And, and Tim, I gotta, I, I'm sorry to go too long, but I gotta tell you one other thing. After World War II, A.V. Hill went right back into academia. You know, he had a little bit of reservation, could he still do science? But he jumped right back in. And they got some great oscilloscopes from the Germans. They, they sort of took them from the German army. And so he started using these oscilloscopes to make even much more uh, accurate recordings of heat production and muscle, and he actually measured heat production in nerves. I mean, he could measure the amount of heat produced by a, an action potential traveling down a nerve fiber, which told him that it was a chemical process. It wasn't simply like a wave traveling along a string. It was an actual biochemical process. Uh, so he made many, many other discoveries um, he, he wrote a couple of books in the, in the last 20 years of his life. So from age 60 to age 80, he continued to remain very, very active in science. I guess that's something that we can all hope for, that we continue to be active until uh, we all retire, right? Yep. So Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and, and sharing with us uh, about A.B. Hill. Um, as we do with all of our guests, uh, we ask them for any, uh, what's the take home message? If the audience listens to nothing but other than the last five minutes, you know, they skip ahead to like the end of the book. What's the take home message from this? Yeah, so for me, a lot of it is um, just A.B. Hill's intellectual curiosity, his, his love of people. Um, and his sense of, you know, what is right and what is wrong. That, that was what really, um, I think, set him apart as a, as, a, as a great scientist, not only a great scientist, but also a great humanitarian. Thank you, Dave, for being with us today. And, and I want to thank all of you for taking the time to download and, and watch the podcast. If you're interested in the article that we've talked about, uh, we flashed it up briefly, but um, look for the, in the end credits, you'll see the citation. For that uh, that article, an illuminating article, and something that you don't see talked about with scientists very often. Uh, as we always do, we hope that all of you stay healthy and well. We hope that you're remembering to physical distance, cough into your elbow, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, and wear a face mask in public. Um, we hope that you will join us next time uh, for another interesting person in the world of sports medicine and human performance. And until then, we hope you continue to stay 
active and healthy.